Speak, Lord. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This afternoon I attempted to talk to you about the oasis of God. Psalm 42, 1 and 2. As the deer pants after the water brook, so pants my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I stand and appear before God? Tonight I want to talk to you about into the depths. Psalm 42, verse 5a, 42, 11a and 43, 5a. Why are you cast down, O my soul? God has called us to experience great depths that we might experience greater heights. Sometimes I feel discouraged and think my work in vain, but then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. There is a bomb in Gilead that can make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead that can heal the sin sick soul. So says the Negro spiritual. Sometimes I'm up. Sometimes I'm down. Yes, Lord. Sometimes I'm almost leveled to the ground. Oh, yes, Lord. This psalm is like that. It's filled with ups and downs. The psalmist is down, Psalm 42, verse 5. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Psalmist is up now. Hope thou in God, for I shall again praise thee, my Savior and my God. Psalmist, psalmist back down now, verse 6. My soul is cast down as I remember you in the land of Jordan and the heights of Hermon and Mount Mizar. Deep calls on the deep at the sound of your waterfalls. Your billows and your waves have gone over me. The psalmist is back up now in verse number eight. You send out your faithfulness, your steadfast love by day. And at night, your song is with me. Verse number nine, the psalmist is up. Oh God, you're my rock. Psalmist is down. Why have you forgotten me? And why must I go on mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Psalmist is still down. Like a mortal wound, my friends continue to taunt me. My enemies continue to taunt me saying, where is your God? Psalmist is still down, verse 11. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Psalmist is back up now. Hope thou in God, for I shall again praise thee, my Savior and my God. And then opens up with verse 1 in Psalm 43. Vindicate me, O God. Defend my cause against ungodly people, against deceitful and unjust people. Deliver me. The psalmist is back up in Psalm 43, verse number two. Oh God, you're my refuge. Back down again. Why have you forsaken me? And why must I go on mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Now the psalmist is really getting ready to have a high. Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me to thy holy hill, to the place of thy dwelling, verse four. Then will I go to the altar of God. O oh God, my exceeding joy, and I will praise you upon the harp. O oh God, my God. Psalm is back down again as he gets ready to close. Psalm 43 and 5. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? But for the final time, he closes with an up. Hope thou in God. For I shall again praise him, my Savior, my God. So the psalmist opens up with panting, Psalm 42 and 1, as the deer pants after the water brook. But he closes with praising. I shall yet praise thee, my Savior and my God. Get used to it. Ministry is just like that. You've got to live between 
lamentation and laughter. You've got to live between pain and pleasure. You've got to live between singing and sighing. You've got to live between feasting and fasting. And you've got to understand that there is this oscillation, this is, there's this alternation, there is this vacillation changing all the time and you've got to adapt to the rhythm of reversal and understand that God gets in between both. He's not only the bright and morning star, He's the lily in your valley. And the psalmist is experiencing life in the depths. It's called depression. Abraham Heschel, the celebrated Jewish rabbi, has what he calls the order of ascendancy, in which he says you can go from silence to sighing, to singing, it's the order of ascendancy. But I want to say that there is also the order of descendancy, where you can drop from singing to sighing, to silence. And all it takes is just one bad diagnosis. All it takes is just one note from someone you've been married to for 25 years who says, I don't want to be a preacher's wife any longer. And I've seen that happen a number of times. All it takes is for some group of leaders in your church to decide that you've stayed long enough. All it takes for you to go from singing, sign, mm, to silence, and you and I have got to adjust and adapt to the order of ascendancy and the order of descendancy, and that's really what's happening in this particular psalm. It's called depression. And someone has said that depression is the common cold of mental illness, that faith and depression cannot coexists within the breast of the believer. I challenge that statement. It can. And sometimes all you can do is say to the Lord is, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Because faith that is not tested is not little faith. It's no faith at all. Faith is tested. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, David Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his classic book, Spiritual Depression, its causes and its cure debunks that. That faith and depression cannot coexist. In fact, some of the greatest saints and sages of all the ages have experienced depression. Here's Moses in Exodus chapter 32 receiving the Ten Commandments, and he receives them while the children of Israel are breaking the first two. And he's coming down from the mountain, and God tells him, go down there because your people have committed a very deep sin. I'm going to wipe them out and start over and create another nation. And you know what Moses says? You can't do it. Do you remember what you promised Abraham? You said to Abraham, out of your seed, all nations will be blessed. And if you take and wipe them out, what are the Egyptians gonna say? They're gonna say, God could bring them out of Egypt into the wilderness, but he could not get them into the promised land. And then Moses becomes an intercessor between God and the people. And Moses says, in so many words. If you decide you're gonna do this, blot my name out of the book of life. And Moses gets to a place where he is the meekest man in all the earth and yet experiences frustration. Elijah goes to heaven without dying. And he goes in 24 hours from the thrill of victory to the agony of defeat. And he says, as he sits underneath that broom brush tree, Lord, take my life, I don't wanna die. He didn't mean that. He didn't need to go past Jezreel where the palace was. 
Jezebel had already put a 24-hour APB out on him, all points bulletin. All he needed to do was to stop right at Je 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 Jezreel, and Jezebel would have taken care of the situation. No, he was frustrated, and he sat there and asked God to take his life after his greatest victory. Be careful. Do not think that you will always ride that wave, and you will always ascend to the place of singing. You will not always sing without some sign and without some silence. And here Jeremiah. Jeremiah wants to resign from ministry. Do you hear that word? In Jeremiah 20, verse number nine. I said I would not make mention, which really in Hebrew means I won't even think about the name of God. I quit. But his word was in my heart like fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary of holding the end. Indeed, I could not. He starts out in verse number nine by saying, I will not, I will not speak any more in his name. The end of verse nine ends with, he, with him saying, but I cannot. He's between two inescapable realities. I will not, and I cannot. Why? Because in the middle, his word was in my heart, like fire shed up in my bone. And you see, if you don't have anything in the middle, you'll never get to the uh, I cannot, because there's something that will keep you from resigning ministry. I don't mean necessarily leaving. I'm talking about just staying on the job, and yet you are living and serving as if you already resigned. Something that continues to motivate you. Something that's bigger than how you feel. Something that's bigger than your acceptance or rejection by people. There is something within that word that's in your heart. Yes, sir. And you don't have the controls because it's in your heart. You can't turn it off or on. It's in your heart. And it's like fire that's shut up in your bones. And you are weary of holding it in. Indeed, you cannot. This psalmist takes a plunge into the depths. Why are you cast down, O oh, my soul? I want to suggest six reasons. That's all I'm going to do tonight. Why this psalmist, I think, plunged into the depths. And why that is a potential residence for all of us. Number one, he plunged into the depths, I think, because of the absence of the temple of God. The absence of the temple of God. Psalm 43 Verse number three. Oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me to your holy hill, which is an expression of the place of the temple, to the place of your dwelling, where God dwells in the city of Jerusalem, dwells on the holy hill. And now these Jews are perhaps a thousand miles away in far distant Babylon. I, I wonder if you can hear them as they say to themselves in Psalm 137 verses one to five, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hung our harps upon the willow trees in the midst of, for there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they who wasted us, exploited us, required of us mirth, entertainment, saying, sing for us one of the songs of Zion. And their response was, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? The temple has been pulverized by Nebuchadnezzar. The third deportation took place in 586 BC while the temple was torn down. How are we going to sing the Lord's song in the strange land? We can't sing Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength of very present help in a time of trouble. This is a strange land. How are we going to sing the 23rd song, which is the most famous? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. Well, how are we going to sing Psalm 37? For, fret not thyself because of evildoers, and don't be envious because of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down, and here you are standing in front of us. How are we going to sing Psalm 121? I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence come my help. 
My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. We can't sing the Lord's song because the temple of God is destroyed. But I want to tell them, but the God of the temple is not. God is not territorial. And God's worship has nothing to do with soil. It has everything to do with spirit. Every time I feel the spirit moving in my heart, that's when I'll pray. I think that preaching ought to be that way. I think service and worship ought to be that way. Ought not, not have anything to do with surroundings. It ought to have to do with internal environment. And if I'm sitting next to you, I'm just telling you, I can have some some unscheduled hits. I don't know when I'm going to get hit because when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, whether it's in a storefront church or a cathedral, I remember I should have been a dead man several times, but God spared my life that I might represent him. Therefore, even though the temple of God is destroyed, the God of the temple is still alive. How are we going to sing the Lord's song? In a strange land, Charles Haddon Spurgeon suffered with clinical depression. One time while preaching, there was a few ruffians up in the balcony who screamed, fire! It caused a stampede. And he was not able to bring the crowd back to a semblance of equilibrium and calmness until 21 people approximately were injured and seven died, stampeded. This dogged his steps and plunged him into the depths of depression. And there were times in which he would vomit, even in his office, as he thought about going out to the pulpit to preach. And as he walked up those steps at the Metropolitan Baptist Tabernacle, every one of those steps, he would say, I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe in the Holy Ghost. Yes, talk about his depression. But when he got to the pulpit, it didn't make any difference. Because once you get to the pulpit, if you can just stand to preach, if you can just get in that classroom to teach, if you can just get in that choir, stand to sing, if you can just get that, I don't care what kind of week you've had, if you can just make your way to the house of God. Now I know, I know, I know, and I understand it. It's nice to have the opportunity to sit in front of a screen and watch the service because you don't have room in your main sanctuary. And listen, this is not a criticism, I'm just observing. And listen to a preacher on a screen, that's nice. I think it ought to be an accompaniment and not a necessity. So that we don't do it uh, out of, uh, of, of a luxury. We do it because it's absolutely necessary. But I wanna tell you, DVDs, will not take the place of being in church. I hear Paul, I hear Paul, I hear Paul saying, or rather whoever wrote Hebrews 10, 25, don't forsake the assembling of yourself together as the manner of some is, as you see the day approaching. We've gotten to the place now that watching television, watching someone preach on television, that's check, no! No, no, no. You got together with the people of God. These Jews missed that kind of gathering. Yeah. And I think, I think, I think that one of the reasons why there is this plunge into the depth is that there is this absence of the temple of God. I hate to admit this. There are a lot of professors in Christian universities, certainly in seminaries, who don't go to church regularly. There are a lot of students in seminaries and Bible colleges who don't go to church regularly. Your classes in religion don't take the place of coming together as the people of God and singing amazing grace and hearing the word preached. Let me just move on for that. All right, so there's this plunge, I think, into the depth.
because of the absence of the temple of God. Number two, there's this plunge in the depths, I think, because not of the absence of the temple of God only, but because of the absence of the God of the temple. The absence of the God of the temple. And you see it in Psalm 42, verses 1, 2, and 3 particularly. As the deer pants after the water brooks, so pants my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Here it is. When shall I come to appear before God? That shows absence. My tears have been my food, verse 3, day and night, while those around me asked, where is your God? Verse number 9, O oh God, you're my rock. Why have you forgotten me and why do you go, why should I go in mourning because of the pressure of the enemy? Verse number 10, like a mortal wound, my enemies continue to taunt me with the question, where's your God? The absence of the God of the temple. John the Baptist was the first cousin of Jesus. He was Jesus' public relations manager. He knew who he was by knowing who he was not. He had a ministry of negation. I am not the bridegroom. I'm the bridegroom's friend. I'm the best man. I am not the light. I've come to bear witness of the light. I did not come to increase. I came to decrease. You want to know who I am? I know who I am by knowing who I am not. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the ways of our God. And Jesus said that out of all the people that had ever been born, he was the greatest. And he served as the precursor, precursor of Jesus. He introduced Jesus. But when he was on death row, Jesus didn't pay him a visit. And John got concerned about it. John sent out uh, an embassy of disciples. The question that was sent to Jesus in Matthew 11 and 3, are you the Christ? Or should we look for another? But time is getting away. I, I want to know that my ministry has been effective. I've been doing all of this for who I thought was the Christ. Are you the Christ or should we? Should I look for another? And Jesus never said, I'm the Christ. He just told John's disciples to go back and tell John, the blind see, the dumb speak, the deaf hear, the lame walk, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And on those and with those words, John went on to his death. Even though Jesus didn't visit him, the absence of the God of the temple. And here is what Matthew says about Jesus in Matthew chapter 25, verse 43. When I was in prison, you didn't visit me. And Jesus did not visit John, his first cousin and the precursor for his ministry. What do you do when there is an absence of the God of the temple and there are no signs and there are no wonders, and there are no miracles. How do you function when God doesn't show up and you don't feel this? And it looks like the heavens represent a ceiling and your, a ceiling and your prayer doesn't go anywhere. And it looks like nothing has taken place. It looks like God has declared a moratorium on sovereign speech and is not saying anything. And the best you can get from God is just a holy hunch. Nothing direct. How do you handle ministry during the absence of the God of the temple? He's hidden. John Calvin and Luther and other reformers call God, or call this expression about God, the Deus absconditus. That is the hidden God. Or the Deus revelatus, the revealed God. That God hides himself at times, and God reveals himself at times as the psalmist is asked, where is your God? 
This hiddenness of God, Calvin calls it in two parts. One, the active hiddenness of God. That God actively hides himself from us. Why? Calvin says because he is holy and we are sinful. And you hear Isaiah saying in Isaiah 59 verse 1, your iniquities have separated you from God. And as Isaiah 59 and 2, and your sins have hid his face from you. That's his active hiddenness. It's really what Habakkuk is saying in Habakkuk 113, that God is of pure eyes, purer eyes, than to behold evil. Active hiddenness. Oh, however you want to look at the cross, you've got to see Jesus who became sin and yet did not sin. You've got to see something happening between the, the Father and the Son. I, I'm foolish to even try to talk about it because I can't explain it. Something mysterious took place. When Christ cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? Why have you left me a derelict? Why? He is a sin bearer. And God the Father turns his back on God the Son in order that he might not turn his back on us. I don't understand it. All I know is Jesus must have loved me because that fellowship for that time at least was at least threatened or it was temporarily broken while he was bearing our sins. It's active hiddenness. But then Calvin says there's passive hiddenness. And that's when because of God's nature, God presents himself in a way that we can't understand. And don't try to demystify the mystery. And don't try to unscrew the unscrutable. And don't try to figure out the unfigure out ability of it. Understand, as Rudolf Otto would say, the German theologian, God works in, God is mysterium tremendum et fascinosum. Which means that God is tremendous mystery that leaves you not only fascinated, but transfixed with tremors. When you really see who God is, this, this business about talking about God in such a frivolous way, the way we talk about God as if he is some kind of associate of ours, and we rob him of his sovereignty, God is so high that even the angels who've been there from the time that they were made, they have an economic use of words when talking about God. All they say about God in Isaiah 6 is they take wings and they cover their face. And the only thing they say is, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the whole earth is full of his glory. And we think we're saying something when we say God is immutable and God is ubiquitous and God is infinite and God is omniscient. And throw all these words around and all the angels can say is you're just holy. Understand, God's passive hiddenness means that you cannot figure him out. God moves in mysterious ways. His wonders to, to perform. He plants his footsteps on the sea and he rides on every storm. And that last verse of William Cowper's song, God's Works in Mysterious Ways, is God is his own interpreter and he will make it plain. God interprets God's self and God reveals God's self so that if we know anything about God it's because of God's self-revelation. You don't figure this stuff out by books. God reveals himself through the divine holy writ so we begin to understand. Listen to this God being described in Psalm 77 verse 19 and 20. God's ways are in the seas, his paths in the waters, but his footprints are unseen. And we love that poem, Footprints in the Sand, because there's resolution. After you've crossed burning deserts and you waded through uh, the deep waters and tunneled through the mountains, and you wind, on the, wind up on the other side, and you look behind you, and you see one set of footprints, and you know that they are, they are not yours because you're being carried. But what happens when you look behind you and you don't see any set of footprints? Because the Bible says his footprints are not seen. What do you do when there are no footprints that's left behind? How do you take a 
and follow a God whose footprints are untraceable. That's really what Paul is saying in Romans eleven thirty three. 33. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. Unsearchable, untrue, unsearchable, untraceable. And his ways are past finding out. I must trust a God who I cannot see when darkness veils his lovely face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. There's going to come a time when you're not going to be able to find one scripture that's going to give you the direction that you need to take for a decision you need to make. And it's because what God has taught you to do during the night that you'll be able, during the day, that you'll be able to make those decisions. Um, we live in, uh, our bedroom is on the second floor of our home in Cincinnati, Ohio. And there's some creaky and squeaky uh, boards. And I learned during the day uh, how to walk around places where the floor would squeak because my wife uh, is a sound sleeper and I get up early, she goes to bed late, so I want her to sleep through. And I learned during the day how to avoid those boards so that at night, I've learned how to walk at night and avoid those things because I learned the lessons during the day. And while you're going through your daytime experience, it will teach you how to handle life during the night because God is teaching you that particular lesson. God's passive hiddenness is hiddenness that you and I will never know about God unless he reveals himself because God is just different than we are. Isaiah 55, 89, God's ways are not our ways, God's thoughts are not our thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are God's ways higher than our ways, and God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So let's just trust him. Let's not investigate him. Let's not send out 10 spies when he's already said the land is yours. Let's trust him and know that he's able to do what he promised that he would do. So that's the second reason. I think that there's a plunging into the depths because of the absence of the God of the temple. Third reason. I think that there is a plunging into the depths because of a melancholy moment. A melancholy moment. Listen to the psalmist in Psalm 42, verse number four. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to lead the procession to the annual three feasts, feast of Pentecost, feast of the Passover, feast of booths, with loud songs and shouts of thanksgiving. And you get that? how I used to. And now I can't do it, the temple is destroyed, and more than likely, this person is in far away Babylon. And as far as he's concerned, he's unemployed. How he used to, it's a melancholy moment. He's saddened by the fact that he is not doing it any longer. I think that, um, the greatest moment in the ministry of Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, is when God took and submitted him to nine months of silence because he didn't believe the message that the Lord gave Gabriel to give to him. That even in your, your old age, Zacharias and Elizabeth, you're going to have a child. And for nine months, he couldn't say a word. Now, what are you going to do with a preacher who can't talk for nine months? What are you going to do with a singer who can't sing for nine months? What are you going to do with, with a professor who can't lecture for nine months? I mean, that's how we serve, with our voices, right? I think that Zacharias was tremendously blessed because now all he can do is listen. Listen to God for nine months. Moses listened for 40 days on Mount Sinai. He has to listen for nine months, can't talk. 
And I think that's one of the greatest weaknesses in our preaching is we don't listen to God. We don't listen to the text. We know the text. One of the greatest obstacles to the knowledge of the Bible is the knowledge of the Bible. What keeps us from knowing more about the Bible is what we think we already know about the Bible. And we know that text and therefore we fail to get God's new revelation. I think God wants us to experience a second, a kind of second naivety where we crawl up into the lap of God and we crawl up into the cranium of Yahweh and stay there long enough until the unfamiliar finally becomes familiar and the mundane becomes majestic and God shows us something that's revelatory. Open my eyes that I might see glimpses of truth I ask for me. Place in my hand the wonderful key that shall unclasp and make me free. Silent and now wait for thee. Ready my God thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, spirit thee fine. It's a moment of melancholy. I think John the Apostle, yes, undoubtedly he had a great ministry in Ephesus. But when he is exiled on the Isle of Patmos, there he receives the revelation of Jesus, the visions, sends seven letters to the churches of Asia Minor. What I'm trying to say is, get rid of this, I remember how I used to. Never put a period where God has put a comma. So many people have made up in their mind, they're wondering, oh, I remember when I used to do this. Now I guess I'm not of any account anymore. And God came, no, 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 no. Stop talking about how you used to. Stop waiting for that big church, First Baptist, First Presbyterian, First United Methodist. Serve where you are right now because God is preparing you for what God is preparing you for. And if you can't be faithful over a few things here right now, you won't be ready for the many. Serve God where he has you. I used to lead the processions, but that's over. Huh? I just don't think that God has a retirement plan for ministry. I don't mean retirement from a job. I'm talking about retirement for ministry. He said, be faithful unto death. And if you're no longer the professor, you're still serving. If you're no longer the pastor, you're still serving. If you're no longer leading Christian education, you're still serving. It's never I used to. It's wherever God has placed me, I'm going to be useful. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be serviceable. So this melancholy moment that always keeps you in the past, sad, disappointing, and feeling that you have nothing to offer to the kingdom, that needs to be jettisoned, that is thrown overboard, discarded, and say God has a new chapter for me to serve in. Number four, I think that there's this plunging into the depth also because of what I call the divine law of all causality. The divine law of all causality. God is the first cause. So everything that happens, God either promotes it, hmm, or God permits it if God is sovereign, there's nothing that God cannot control. Amen. Nothing. Whatever God permits, he has a purpose to promote. And even if it is evil, God is sovereign over the process. You ought to hear what Joseph says in Genesis 15 and 20. You meant unto me for evil. But God meant unto me for good to save much people alive. God is the first cause. Listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm 42 and 7. Deep calls under deep. At the sound of your waterfalls, your cataracts, your billows, your waves have gone over me. Do you get that? Your waterfalls, your billows, your waves, they're drowning me. Some have already intimated and inferred that this deep calling in the deep is an anticipation of deity talking to deity, of the spirit talking to God. 
It does happen, you know, in Rome, Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our infirmities. Because we don't know how to pray as we are. But the Spirit makes intercession for us to God. With groans, with moans that cannot be uttered. And Hebrews 7, 25 says that we have a high priest who ever liveth to make intercession to God for us. It's deity talking to deity. It's spirit talking to God as Father. It's Jesus, the Son of God, talking to God the Father. Deep calls under deep. Maybe that's the intimation there. Maybe that's the inference there. Maybe that's the implication there. But there's more than that. Your billows and your waves and your waterfalls are drowning me. Your, you are in charge of them. And he says, you are the cause of that. You and I look at Job. Job's big problem is he didn't know the prologue. He didn't know that the devil and God were talking behind his back. He didn't know, he didn't know the prologue at all. Didn't know the epilogue even. And God said to Satan, as Satan was in the presence of God, have you considered my servant Job? Yes, but you have him under divine protective custody. You got a fence around him. You got a hedge around him. No one can get to him. But if you take and remove the hedge, I'll make him curse you to your face. You've got him as the highest person on your payroll in the East. He's the richest man in the East. You've got, he has seven sons and three beautiful daughters. He's got health and wealth. He's got a fine marriage. He's got friends. Why wouldn't he serve you? But let me strip him and put him on the soup line. And let me make the doctor's office his second home. And let me turn his wife to unfaith so that she says, curse God and die. And let me reduce his family in terms of children to nothing so that he has to attend 10 funerals in one place, in one day, all of his children. And let me turn his friends against him so that they will say, God is punishing you because of some evil that you've done. And let's see if he will trust you. God talks big. I tell people in chapter 1 and chapter 2, God's talking. For the next 35 chapters, chapter 3 to 37, God says nothing. And it's not until chapter 38 that God speaks again. And he answers Job out of the whirlwind. Where were you, Job? Job has to wait 35 chapters before God intervenes and speaks. How long can you wait? Can you wait 35 chapters before God speaks and you have been crying out to him and he hasn't said a word? Some of you are in chapter 27. You've only got 10 more chapters to wait. Some of you are in chapter 17. You've got 20 chapters to wait. And some of you are in chapter 37 and you only have one more chapter to wait and you're ready to throw in the towel. I want to tell you, if you can just hold out to tomorrow, if you can just keep faith through the night, if you can just hold out to tomorrow, everything will be all right because weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning. One more chapter to wait and God does break through and speaks in 38, 39, 40, and 41. And then God says to Job, and you said you wanted to say something. Yes, Lord, I've seen, heard of you with my ear, but now I've seen you face to face, and I have to repent in sackcloth and ashes because all of that talking I was doing, I had no idea what I was talking about. And you know what God says in the end? Job is my servant. Yeah. What? He says, my servant Job in chapter one and two, and then he tells his three miserable comforters, his friends, Bildad, uh, Elphaz, and Zophar, go to my servant Job and offer sacrifice that he might pray for you. See, even though Job belly ached, God said, you're still my servant. Because as Augustine said, no matter what good you do, God cannot love you more. And no matter what evil you do, God cannot love you less. 
God's love is not mercurial. It's not like mercury in some kind of thermometer that goes up and down based upon what you do or don't do. God's love is steadfast. That's why we sing, great is thy faithfulness. Amen. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. You can't earn brownie points with God. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. And therefore, I serve a God who is faithful even when you and I are not faithful. He is not a contractual God. He is a covenantal God. And here is Job who has to deal with this divine law of all causality that God permitted this, could have stopped it. And yet God allowed for it to happen in order to achieve God's purpose. What's going on in your ministry, in your life? Which God has permitted to happen. It doesn't taste good. And in essence, by itself, it is not good. But it's necessary in order for God to grow us and to get us to trust him. Let me move on to five because I want to get done with the six. The fifth one, another reason for this plunging into the depth, I think, is because of the amnesia of God. The amnesia of God. Psalm 42, verse 9. Oh God, you are my rock. Sounds good. Very next breath. Why have you forgotten me? Can the Almighty get, get Alzheimer's? Can the divine get dementia? Why have you forgotten me? Can the sovereign one have a senior moment? Why have you forgotten me? Can the savior have senioritis? Why have you forgotten me? And you just got finished singing, thought you're my rock. And then the, the very next breath, why have you forgotten me? This is abrasive speech to talk to God like that. Why have you forgotten me? This is uncensored language. Why have you, who can't forget anything, forgotten me? George MacDonald was right when he said that to complain about God means that you are nearer to God than when you are indifferent about God. The fact that you can tell God how you feel and complain about God rather than to be indifferent. Whatever God does is fine. However he manages your life, fine. You have no input. That is not real. Now if you want, you know, when you study the Psalms, please understand. And what we try to do with all the scripture oftentimes is to take a um, fingernail file or nail file and if there are um, fingernails or toenails that need to be clipped, we'll clip them off because we don't want to snag our clothes or our socks. Women don't want to snag their holes. And then we'll take a, uh, um, a kind of a, a sand off because we want everything to be sanded really nice. This is not language that can be clipped. Leave the nail hanging. Leave the snag there. Stop trying to tame the text. Don't tame it, let it run wild. God, why have you forgotten me? Don't you ever feel that way? Why have you forgotten me? Even the very son of God, Jesus, listen to him on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And notice what he says. He uses that possessive pronoun. My God, my God, you're still my God. You may have forsaken me, but you're still my God. No separation in terms of our relationship. You're still my God. Mm. And he moves from the fourth word, my God, why, to the seventh word, Father, into thy hand, I commend my spirit. Because it takes a while to go from my God, why, to Father, into thy. And you'll get there eventually. Oh, you, you see the same thing in terms of this abrasive language throughout the Psalms. 
if you want safe territory and you want to um, clip the nails so that, in fact, you won't even have to clip them in some places, get out of Psalms. Don't read Psalms. Get in Proverbs. It's safer there. I mean, a good name is better to be desired than riches. You're safe there. Read the Proverbs. Don't read the Psalms. The Psalms will have imprecatory prayers. You can't handle it and stop trying to smooth it out. Listen to the psalmist. Why have you forgotten me? I think that's what Joseph must have felt. He's sold by his brothers. And I know that we're very quick to run to Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. We love to quote that. And the brothers, of course, are very concerned about him retaliating because now their father Jacob is dead. And he says to them, don't be afraid, brothers. Verse 20. What you meant unto me for evil, God meant unto me for good to save you alive. Yes, yes, now he didn't say that when his brother sold him into slavery. It took him years to get to that point. He didn't say that when Mrs. Potiphar put a phony molestation charge on him. He didn't say, what was meant to me for evil, God meant for me for good. No, it took him a while to say that. He didn't say that when the butler and the baker forgot about him for a while. He didn't say that. It took him years before he understood. And you see this in the 45th chapter where he says several times to his brothers, the Lord sent me to Egypt. The Lord sent me to Egypt. The Lord sent me to Egypt. It takes a while before you understand that God has really been up to something. Yeah. And you've been upset and frustrated with God. Don't you know that you can tell God how you feel? Yes, he already knows. You just as well as say it. The psalmist says in Psalm 139 verse 2, he knows my thoughts are far off, which really means that while the thoughts are on its way to my head, God abducts the thought. God kidnaps the thought. And God interprets the thought before you get the thought. And so just because you don't say it doesn't make any difference. He knows what you're going to say before you even think about saying it. So tell him how you feel. God is not fragile. He's faithful. And if you've got a relationship with him, you can tell him whatever you want to tell him. Now, we'll tell you this. God will give you the first word, but he's going to have the last word. And Job will tell you that. But I'm so glad that I serve a God that I can just open up and share my frustration and share my pain and share my doubts and know that he's not going to forsake me and that God is going to fix me so that I can bow at his feet and still say to him, yes, Lord. Providence is like Hebrew. It has to be read backwards. Backwards. As Soren Kierkegaard, the 19th century Danish theologian says, life must be lived forward, but it can, must be understood backwards, backwards, backwards. It takes you a while to live long enough to know why God has brought you through some things. It seems frivolous, it seems ridiculous, and as in Exodus 13, 17, and 18, God, when he brought them out of Egypt, the Bible says, he did not lead them in on the way toward the Philistines, which is the shorter route, but he led them through the wilderness, toward the Red Sea, which is the longer route, because had he led them toward the Philistines, they would have become afraid and would have turned back. That's what the text says. And sometimes God will lead you the long way around to get you where he wants you to go. Oh, he will. I say this because it's amazing, because I, I was not one who would ever fly a plane. I believe what my mama said, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. But when I went to serve Beeson Divinity School for Cincinnati, Ohio, 500 miles each way and preaching uh, at a church for 48 Sundays, I had to start flying. And I would fly on silver, my silver status, I got moved up to silver. But you don't really get any upgrades on silver, it's okay, it's nice silver. And I could leave Cincinnati at 7 a.m. and get to Birmingham at 7 a.m. on the same day because Cincinnati was Eastern Standard Time and Birmingham was Central. So I could leave and arrive at the same time I left. 
direct flight. Cincinnati to Birmingham, Birmingham to Cincinnati. It was a hub then, but no longer is it a hub. Now I'd have to fly from Cincinnati, go over to Atlanta, stay for two and a half hours to get a connected flight to Birmingham. Leave Birmingham, get ready to go to Cincinnati, fly to Atlanta, get a connected flight two and a half hours, sit there and go to Cincinnati. That moved me up because that's four legs, four segments. Then I got up to gold. And then God would want me to go to the places to preach during the week. And sometimes I'd have to fly backward. I want to go to Memphis, Tennessee, and I'd fly from Birmingham to Memphis. But no, I had to fly back to Atlanta and then get a connecting flight and fly past High Birmingham where I started to go to Memphis. But that moved me up to platinum. And I'm getting some upgrades now, quite a few. Then I kept making all of those connecting flights, spending time in Atlanta and other places waiting on my connecting plane. Now I've been moved up to diamond. So much so that every time I get on a plane, may I take your coat? What would you like to drink? I don't say that evidently. All I'm saying is I've flown backwards so many times in order to go forward. <laughs> and some of us want direct flights in ministry. It will not happen all the time. You're going to have to fly backwards. You're going to have to sit and wait in the station when you rather have a direct flight. And then you're going to have to fly past where you want to get off. That's where you want to go. And God will say, no, not now. I'm flying you past it. And then when you want to go backwards, I'm going to fly you past where you were, get to the place where you're going to wait, and then fly you there. It takes a while. But God has a way of helping you to read your life backwards and see that he is doing something so beautiful. Take your hand off of it. Stop telling him to just order your steps. Tell him to order your stops too. Tell him. Right on King Jesus. Right on Emmanuel. Right on conquering King. I want to go to heaven in the morning. My time is up. I wanted to get to number six. I'll get to number six tomorrow. I believe in time. I'm going to stay on time. So we'll deal with the sixth one tomorrow, which is this idea of a lack of vindication on the part of God as the psalmist perceived it in Psalm 43 and 1.